Hi guys, uh, this is a third session for a winter seminar. Uh, in this session, we will talk about project management frameworks, uh, particularly about three frameworks that will help you as a computer science student to collaborate and do and work together with other peers. So first, uh, the motivation for this uh, seminar it's similarly to what other seminars, what the motivation motivation was. So uh, first of all, the main thing is to help you how to organize your projects. So normally when you have a project, like a homework or like a lab research, many times you just do incrementally what you have to do and you don't really divide the work that much it just keep pushing every day and while sometimes it works uh you don't have an idea of when you're gonna finish your your job and also if you want to collaborate with people it might be quite harder to do it since there is no rules actually so in my case i came to this kind of concept by fail <laughs> by having by failing in delivering projects in their time and not only once actually several times so over time i read more about this project management things and i came to know about some ways that i can help you so once again uh, I'm not an expert, especially in this area, maybe about coding in C++, Linux, I might have some expertise level. But when it comes to project project management, I'm quite beginner. So I just know some frameworks that I use uh, in daily basis. And as a user, I will just gonna tell you what it's about, but I don't have a deep knowledge about any of it. I don't even know if there is a deep knowledge about that kind of things because as I read in some of the books, uh, those uh, frameworks are not something that you need to follow right away. It's something that you need to tailor to what your project requires and the size of the team, how the people are willing to engage in this cooperation level. Uh, if they are extroverted or introverted, uh, there are many variables. So those ones are like uh, maybe templates or patterns that might sound more appropriate to this concept that you have to somehow adapt to your personal situation. So, but the main idea it's, well, it's to reduce your stress and measure what you do and work with other people efficiently. So my inspiration, uh, it was about, well, so I explained my motivation, but my inspiration, it was this book. Uh, we cannot read the title well, but it's written The Phoenix Project. It was a great book. It explained you what at maybe dev ops like a uh, developer operations does and this this guy that he's working in a as a software engineer in a company somewhere in the US and so he gets promoted to a management position and then he have to deal with many many troubles so he started by removing waste and he he basically applies many concepts that we wanna talk shortly, and he makes the company to again be able to deliver projects on time, improve communication among the workers, and many other things. So the topics we're gonna cover in these presentations are different techniques, I mean, different frameworks for project, project management. So all of them are related to computer science. And the first one is the typical approach, is the one that's obvious. 
So it's called waterfall. You might use it for any kind of project in your life, not only computer science. And then we're gonna go to the lean software development and then following extreme programming and then Scrum, Kanban and DevOps. So the order, it's more from the obvious to the less obvious. And until Kanban, it's from somehow uh, less agile to the more agile somehow. So let's get started with waterfall. So what is waterfall? So waterfall is what we usually do when we get an assignment. So we first read the requirements and then if you're in a project or in a company startup, you make the requirements or you survey people and you get to know what the requirements are. Uh, it's a very important step. You don't want to end that finishing your project and then you fail to find out what, what the requirements are. However, it's not easy. It's uh, Normally many projects fail to find the requirements first because well, they don't know. Even the customer, even if they got to talk with the customer, the customer doesn't even know. And or uh, and in my in well in the for example in a laboratory, if the person who makes the requirements is your professor, he doesn't really know at the moment whether those requirements are correct or not. Since maybe after some research he finds out that uh, the requirement that he sets are not what you have to do now. So it's very complicated and it's very dangerous step because it's the first one. <laughs> so, but well, you get the requirement, imagine that was easy, or I mean, you just got it. And then now uh, you design your code. So in this step, all this software architecture object-oriented programming, diagrams, class diagrams, uh, well, yeah, all the kind of uh, user cases, uh, that's where it all goes there. So in university, in college, you might have studied about software engineering and you already know some things about it. You know about design patterns, maybe. If you don't know, you know how more or less divide into classes, components, or whatever uh, programming technique you're following. And, and well, it's important because if you have a very solid d design for your software, then, well, it will shorten the time, it will be easier to sell, and it's good. So once you get your design, you will move to the implementation of the, of the design. That's what most of the people think about computer science, coders, they do, right? It's uh, you sit in, the, in your computer and then you put your headsets, your earphones, play your music and you start to start to code. And well, you code a lot, make many lines, compile. And well, eventually you get what you have, you get what you want. So after you finish that implementation part, you go through the verification part, which are mostly, you make some tests, you try different inputs, you try, you show to the people, maybe you release an alpha and then a beta. And then, so you want to find out whether what you have done, it's satisfy the requirements and then you want to check what you have done is actually stable somehow and it's a uh, industry level or if it's a laboratory it's somehow not very buggy and you really did what you said you're gonna do so in the research paper well you are not faking anything and then finally, after you done that part, somehow your code is, your software is finished. 
but you have to maintain it. There's going to be bugs. There's going to be new features. There's going to be many things that you need to add. And that's where maintenance part comes. So uh, it looks OK. It looks obvious. It looks just fine. But there is some little problem here. If the require so as I said before, imagine the situation where your professor is telling you to do some software, and then all this process until verification. Let's forget about maintenance. Man. Uh, it takes maybe eight months, and then by this time, after eight months, you have this pretty solid piece of so software which really satisfies the requirements. However, at that time, your professor he might say. Hey, the idea that we had about those features is actually it's not a good idea. After the simulation, we found out that it's not good. So we need to change it. So then now you have to go back to requirements, change the requirement, change the design, implement again, and verify again. So <clears throat> it's not that good, actually, to be honest, because it's very, this model, it's good under the assumption that whenever you jump to one stage to the other one, nothing is going to change. But that's not normally the case. So maybe in an assignment, actually, yeah, in an ass in assignment, maybe even hard assignments. I mean, let's say if you know about Pintos operating system, it's a pretty long assignment. It will take you a few months to finish it. Yeah, you have all the requirements there. There is a manual, and then in that case, then yeah, sure, go this way. But in a real world project, it's not good. I should say that in certain projects, it might be good. Like I, you are coding software for, I don't know, airplane, some avionics software. Then you really need some requirements to be approved by certain organization that uh, satisfies on a standard. And then the design. So in that sense, yeah, well, maybe you have to do like that. But in many other cases, which is not critical, the software to be somehow are free of any kind of bug from the first release, you don't want this one. So yeah, it's totally wrong. It's very, it's not what you should do. Forget about that, that idea. It's obvious, but it's not good. So, yeah, as I said, uh, the first point is what I said. It's requirement change. You need to change everything. And it will take you a lot of time and a lot of stress. You w will become unsure what you are doing. And maybe you even lose interest in your project, which is a very bad thing. So, well. There is a good news. In the 21st century, uh, project management for um, software projects are a little bit different. They have some innovative ideas. And well, many of them are not from this century, are from the previous one. But they were mostly applied to manufacturing, like a Kanban or just in time or lean manufacturer but well from the 90s until now they start to apply these kind of things to the software development <clears throat> so let's get started with our first solution so what if we do forget about maintenance man. what if we do from one to four in a short time span so if it was eight months to deliver all the features, let's start with a very, very buggy half cook version that takes two months to do it. And then we get until here. And maybe if there was five features to deliver, we only delivered two. But after two months, we had this software which does those two features working. So what if we do like that? So we had this iteration of two months. So yeah, we plan, do, check, react. And then by the time that we finish that part, then we think about, hey, in the team, 
uh, how did it go? We finish it in two months. This kind of sketch, like a very first, very buggy version. So if it's, I mean, the and then the team will say, oh yeah, there was it was good because of this one, but it was bad because something. So then they talk about it and say, okay, so for the next iteration, we're gonna implement one more feature or maybe two of them. And then for those two ones, we're not gonna repeat the same mistake we repeat in the previous one. So that's what Lean Framework it is. So the idea it's having many iterations, well, many, as much as you need. And then every iteration, you incrementally improve the quality of your software. And every time you iterate, you remove waste, which means things that were not good in your team or in your, in your development. So you always, at every iteration, at the end, or at the beginning of the next iteration, you will make sure that you're not going to do the same mistakes you did in the previous one. Or if you need some new tool, if you need something, you will provide it. So the idea is that as the iteration goes by, productivity increase. And then after certain iterations, you will have your complete product. And then the other good part about this one is because you keep iterating, you don't deliver all the features at the same time. If something change in the requirements, because you keep, you keep coming back to the requirements every like a, two months in our case, it's much cheaper to have a new requirement or to change the requirement because you don't have the eight months, you actually have the two months and you're halfway. So that was our first solution. It's pretty solid. Let me check the time. And it's actually really work. I mean, it's easy to implement. It's uh, it's not so that's that's very nice. It's easy. There is not many rules. Just like that. If you search online, there there will be books written about this. But those ones are the main ideas. And then you can just implement it in your team. Or if you work alone, it's also possible. Actually, it's a good thing to do. I try to do in my life. So. They had this, uh, uh, well, I forgot the, so they had this this war in the Japanese war, which literally it means improvement. Actually, I learned this from my operation class and <clears throat> technology, technology management class. So I forgot the Japanese war. It sounds very similar to the Korean war, but in Korea it's called Kaeson. And Keso is improvement. So they always talk, I mean, they refer to this lean manufacturing in that case. So the idea is that continuously improving. Always try to improve the process because then you will improve productivity and then you can spend time in things, things that requires more intellectual skill, creative, and less time in mechanical task. And it's really applies to software. You know, we are lazy people. <laughs> I mean, everyone somehow is lazy, but somehow I got to know that in the computer science world, we are a little bit more lazy. <laughs> and we, but we are kind of in the sense that we try to be smart about it and we try to automatize as much as we can, because we know that if we automatize the process or the tools that we use, everything, which is actually the process itself, we will spend less time in the office and we will enjoy more time with our friends, family. So that's part of it. And that's something that you have to aim. You don't want to be 24, well, 12 hours a day, six days a week, in your workplace or in your lab, struggling, repeating the same things over and over again. Your goal should be to go there every, like a four or three hours per day and then do what you have to do for one day and finish it. That's amazing, but it's possible. I think, I believe it's possible. Well, if you apply this improvement thing, Kaeson in Korea. So 
second solution it adds more techniques so the first one we had this very simple four step diagram now we have well so now we have more steps more stages so well as you might see there is a a lot of plan so now we don't talk about uh requirements now we're talking about release plan so well uh first of all uh, this one is called extreme programming it's from the 90s i'm not very sure but uh window xp it comes from that war come from that concept it was uh called it in that way maybe <laughs> so it's kind of fun when i talk about extreme programming the first time i tried to introduce it in my team what they said to me was it sounds like uh that kind of programming that you got you go crazy and you keep calling until 6 a.m and drinking a lot of coffee and non-stop then finish it, something you have to do in one month within five days but it's not like that at all actually it's the other way around quite a lot so it's more about this kind of smart way of programming so as a well as a calendar i mean as a schedule it's different stage over time we have we substitute the requirement step as a release plan so in the release we this so we have this little table and we say okay by this date we're gonna deliver this feature it's a roadmap actually simply talking and then for every so then over time we have like a few things that we're going to deliver every some time so to deliver those features we divide in iterations normally they are time box what i mean they are mostly always the same time span so maybe like uh for the first release we release every two months but we have two weeks iterations so we got four iterations overall and then after we <coughs> we had this iterations plan four iterations in our case let's say we make some documents where we say okay so we finish this so uh we make sure that the iteration is successful if we satisfy these little requirements, which is acceptance test. <clears throat> Wait a second, I'll drink some tea. And then uh, we start iteration every day. We, when you go to office or if you do online, chatting, whatever you, you need, you make sure to talk with everyone, like a, 50 minutes no sorry five minutes meeting or three minutes it's very short just to ask everyone uh how was yesterday work there was something uh there was any obstacle yesterday there was any good idea that kind of questions you ask it's very flexible it doesn't i read some books and they always say you have to be three questions no it can be the main idea is to make sure what happened in the previous day and the plan for the current day and then well so that's one day level and then for every day i mean every hour so well so let's just forget about this part right now so uh extreme programming is they have many techniques and many ways of programming that they suggest and they say that we should adopt it so first one is a unit test so unit test uh i assume you know what it said so in this framework before you implement a feature you have to implement the unit test for that feature and what i mean by feature in this case i mean a class behavior so there should be nearly 100 percent text test coverage Second part is a pair programming. They encourage a lot pair programming. So the idea is that while 
two developers just sitting in one desk. And then while one of them is coding, the other one is looking how he's coding. Uh, I try this one sometime. Every sometime is good. I mean, every day, little time is fine. But I found myself going crazy if you stay for like a four or five hours with the other dude looking at your screen while you're coding. Because the other guy gets bored eventually. So I encourage doing that, but uh, maybe 50 minutes per day. So the other guy gets to know what you're doing. And he might help you with some things that he sees while you're coding. And then the other part, Refactor. So I like this part because I like to Refactor. So Refactor is like a, <clears throat> it's a task that doesn't implement any new feature to your code, but it just made the code inside the engine to work better and to be easier to maintain. So whenever you implement a new feature in this iteration plan, you always have to clean up the mess you have done. So this is related to the uh, cyclometric uh, complexity. So you have to be careful how you write code because otherwise, if you don't refactor enough, you might end up after certain lines, maybe 10,000, 20,000, that adding something new is so hard that sometimes it's easier to just from the beginning, write a new software. And that was my case one year and a half ago. And it was terrible. We lost, I mean, it was terrible in the sense that we lost one year of work just to re-implement a kind of complex, relatively big piece of software. And then user stories. We're gonna talk about this one a little bit later versus tasks. So you're not talking about features anymore. You're talking about user stories, which are kind of like a use cases. So, well, we're not, we're gonna talk later about this one. And a lot of meetings, a lot of communications overall. It doesn't have to be in person. It can be online. It can be chatting. But the main idea is to have a, a lot of communication. It's good. I mean, I personally, I personally like to talk a lot. Some people doesn't really like sometimes, but well, it have to be done. I think it's the right way to go. So here is some pictures. <laughs> so as it says in the ch charts, when you have these agile methodologies, like at the first one and second one, do you have this kind of graph? There's many iterations. And this is a change over time. So because you have many, as you're growing, you have lower risk. But when you're using the waterfall methodology, as time goes by, if you add more changes, it's getting harder, actually. So that's uh, the idea about this graph. Let me check the time. OK, good, 30 minutes. Next, uh, Scrum. So Scrum, it's very popular uh, framework. And well, it follows, it's an extension of XP and Lean Manufacture, but it has a very, how can I say, it adds more things. So I will say a strict time box for iterations. Uh, you have new meetings, which is called rest retrospective meeting, a spring meeting, and release meeting. While in, in XP, you have plans. It's not, doesn't have to be a meeting. I mean, it's flexible. In a Scrum, it's actually say, okay, you have to be a meeting. 
And then now you divide in your team different kind of people. So you wanna have one guy who is a scrum master. So his only job is to make sure that people can work well. If they have some problem, he will fix it. If they need some tool, he will get it. And he will organize the meetings, try to the people to be communica communicative, uh, try to install a good environment in the workplace, whether it is online or offline, I should say. And also you get the product owner. So the product owner is the guy who decides which features or user stories should be implemented first in which order he puts priorities so he's always trying to talk with a customer or trying to get information about how the requirement should be and then he prioritizes continuously and that's his job and then a scrum master should be able to enhance the communication between the development development team and the product owner and yeah, so other than that, it's very similar to XP where you have the, so well now iterations are called a sprints in a scrum, but the same concept. So you have the sprints planning, sprint bed log. Well, so for every iterations, you have a certain user stories you want to implement. So user storage are a small features so maybe say improve the let's say the performance of the some website that's a user story and normally they're written as a as an user i would like to when i click to this button have this feature to happen that's usually written like that and then for every sprint uh iteration same thing you will have a, a certain user stories that you want to implement. So let me show you with an example. Mm -hmm. So here we have a, a Kanban. And so we have this for my project. And then we have a um, product, back, product backlog. And those ones are task or user stories that we have to implement. So this part, it's like a long term. Uh, we didn't decide when we, got, when we want to implement it. We cannot decide it in the roadmap, but it's very loose. And then in this part, it's for this iteration, this sprint. So it works like that. The product owner, he will change the order of the task to make sure make sure that uh, the ones with more priority, they are on the top. And then for every iterations, we're gonna put in here which task we're gonna do for the next two weeks, for example. And then people will take it from there. So uh, developers, they say, okay, I want to do this one. So they move it to the in progress pipeline and then they assign themselves. So that's how it works. That's pretty much how the iteration sprints in Scrum. So yeah, they have many sprints and in the sprint, they decide what they're gonna do at the beginning. At the end, they talk about what happened. They have release meetings. They have the user story. They have the product owner, scrum master. And then that's it. But maybe, maybe it's too complicated for my small projects. Maybe I'm just two persons or three persons working we have a lot of communication. Maybe the first approach iterations or maybe some part of XP, it was a good idea. 
but this Scrum looks very tough. We have product owner, Scrum master. I don't even know what a Scrum master does. Someone might think. And well, so there is some alternative that might be much simpler. And yeah, I will recommend it. So one of them might be continuous integration. So let me put it this way. Imagine that this guy finishes peer SQL and then he put it here. And then when he finishes, it, he, it will go away, right? After the review. So at that time, imagine that automatically we release a version with a number that he has a feature. And then just like that, we don't we don't have it to do. We have the product backlog. So over time, as we're finishing things, people is taking things from here and put it here like that. And we don't have time box. We don't have iterations. It's just, just like that. It just goes. And then by the time that it's around here, new release and totally new release. If you're making a web website, the website gets upgraded. If you're making a Chrome ext extension, you push like a new one. And yeah, just like that. So we forget about iterations. We forget about everything and not everything, sorry. <laughs> I mean, we forget about these roles like a Scrum Master, Project Owner. And in some cases, it really, really works well. Websites mostly. If you're making something maybe more, how can I say, more traditional, maybe not. And yeah, that's good. So another way of going, it's similarly to continuous integration, but then it just adds one more thing. What it adds is actually something that many people use. Eh? It's called work in progress, WIP. So it's same as the continuous integration in the sense that you don't have this to do, you just have the backlog. But you make sure you set some work on progress so your developers can now work at the same time in more than maybe two tasks here and then three tasks here and then like that. So in that sense, you make sure that uh, all the pipelines that are working, somehow there is no bottlenecks. And it goes way beyond that. Uh, there is a whole philosophy, well, philosophy is a very strong term, but <clears throat> the advice that uh, one developer, the best that he can do is doing one thing at a time and then trying to encourage it by putting those limits. And the same as a continuous integration, by the time that something goes after review, it goes deploy, it goes release. And as I, one tool that comes very handy if you watch the previous seminar, you which we did cover about that, it was Travis in GitHub. Let me show you. <laughs> so for the pull request, it's out of the topic in this seminar, but I already covered in the previous. So this Travis for this pull request, it's it runs on a script in a virtual machine somewhere. We don't need to know where is it. So the good thing about this one 
is that after the tests are passed, we can do something useful. In my case, I always run this conditional call. So basically what I do is I, I have a website where I have all the documentation from my code. So I deploy it there and that's what it does. But if your project was actually a website, you can just deploy in your server, your hosting server. And that's very nice thing. So I, well, I define it in here. It looks terrible in this eight. Yeah, uh, this is the code. So that, that's how I define it in Travis. So you can change it to, in the case you're doing a website, you can change it for that. And then also it's possible to make a release of your projects and put it in the GitHub. In just increments, I don't know, one number. And yeah, then you will achieve continuous integration in your team. And that will help you a lot because you don't have to manually make a new release and all the stuff. Yes, after it's merged in master, it's released. As simple as that. So, <laughs> so well, uh, that's what we have talked so far. And then this is quite different, but I thought that it will be nice to introduce it because next topic is a DevOps. So it's very, how can I say? I I I must say that uh, everything I cover in this winter seminar, it's somehow related to this DevOps. So I always keep repeating, automatize. It's great. It saves you time. It makes things easy. It makes you your job much more interesting. And then continuous integration is a great thing we have seen it it's part of the automatizing managing git and github and the other tools to assure, ensure communication in the team we covered before like a slack or send have and monitor and test the application so in this case it's mostly make sure that new improvement results on same performance or better, or, or at least measure. And also this DevOps, which is actually a real position, people work as a DevOps. They might be part-time, they might be full-time. They also make sure that, uh, well, they are operation people as well. So if they have deployed their software in some machines, they make sure that it's keep working and it's upgraded and there is no problem. And then as a final topic, as a final concept, uh, which is quite important in, in this DevOps, I should say about infrastructure as a code. Uh, this one is a great thing. And it's very related to automatizing things. So the idea is that actually it's like as I, as I did here, I just input these three things and then somewhere I will create a virtual machine, which actually just follow, I mean, it, it's a precise Ubuntu and it's a, a container. Docker, and then yeah, with those package and those settings, so I somehow the infrastructure of my software I can manage it with my code because this one is a code. It's not a code like a 
uh, imperative language or something like that. Well, maybe here it is. But declarative call, uh, programming. But it's a code. And it's a great thing because I don't have to manually do it. I don't have to provide, actually. I don't have to buy a new server and set up, install everything. I just like that. And this one can be applied to many, many other things. The unfortunately is out of the scope of this seminar. So well, uh, this is the end of our project management frameworks. Uh, I'm not sure if I went too slow or too fast, but one more time, I'm not an expert, but I got to use those frameworks and it really helps you. And for those who are working in a laboratory, which is my case, and they are involved in somehow medium and long-term projects, I will say adopt continuous integration, Kanban, and some parts from extreme programming. It's very, how can I say, it's very easy to adopt. And the idea of automatizing removing waste and refactor. It's very powerful and it just makes your life in your job more exciting. Because I don't know, I'm, I, I'm that kind of person, I think that everyone is that kind of person who kind of enjoys making his life easier. So this is part of it. And, and well, also as a last note, for this seminar, I will say that like, communication is very important. And even though it's hard, even though there might be different cultures, I highly encourage you to try harder because there might be many misconceptions and many things that it might be just not have happened if you had more communication. So if you have any questions, please leave some feedback, some comments. And as I said, I'm just a student. I'm not sure about the quality of my presentations. I normally present in a front in front of a crowd. So it's easy for me to know if they like it or normally they interrupt and then we have this conversation over and over again. These are very different formats. Uh, I'm just talking alone in the computer. But as I said before, it's part of my it's part of my requirement to graduate in my university. And I happily do it. I like it. But it's the first time I'm doing this one. So yeah, whatever good idea you have, please let me know. Thank you.